Let us turn now to the reading of God's word. As we prepare to listen to scripture, please join me in the prayer for illumination found in your bulletin. Lord, we are weary travelers in this world. Let your word be a roadmap helping us find our way. Let it be a rest stop reviving our spirits. Let it be the fuel that empowers us to move forward. In the name of our Savior, we pray. Amen. Our first scripture lesson is from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope is in the Lord. For the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him there is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture lesson comes from Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. Um, and I was, as I was just going through the story of the fall with the children, this is a story we know well. Uh, God puts Adam and Eve in the garden. God gives them rules, gives them an expectation, and unfortunately, they don't keep it. They don't stick to those expectations. And there is a consequence. In verses 8 through 15, we begin to hear about the consequences of sin for Adam and Eve and, and for the generations to follow. So let us listen now to God's word. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, who's excited to talk about sin today? Any, anyone? Yeah? No? Well... We're going to, <laughs> we're going to, no matter what, because in more ways than one, sin is kind of unavoidable. You can't get around it. I've heard it said that of all the Christian doctrines, sin is the only one that's empirically verifiable. Sin's the only one, the existence of sin, the only teaching of our faith that nobody can deny because we've all seen it with our own senses. We've all encountered it. Throughout history and in the modern day, human beings have always been able to tell that there is something wrong with the world. There's something wrong with ourselves. And no matter how hard we try, we simply cannot fix everything. There is no getting around sin. Sin is also central to the Genesis reading today. I mean, no sooner has God established creation and declared it good, indeed, very good, then sin slithers in and disrupts the harmony and the balance. We know well the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent's temptation with the forbidden fruit, whatever kind of fruit it may have been. 
Here today, we're reminded in particular about the consequences of sin, the, the broken relationships that occur, the guilt, the psychological and physical pain that results from it. When sin enters into our lives, it hurts. It hurts us, and it hurts those around us. There is no getting away from it. Now, all that notwithstanding, I'm aware that most of us don't like to talk about sin. I'm personally not real big on standing up here and berating all of you for all of the sins that I think you're committing. Some stripes of Christianity may be a little more eager than others to do that, but Presbyterians are not one of them. In fact, I know as a denomination, we've been accused of being afraid to talk about sin. We, we, we have abandoned our conviction about sin, that there's anything wrong with people, and, and all we really want is to just make everyone feel warm and fuzzy and, and loved and accepted and included. I don't think that's true. I don't think that that's all Presbyterians have to say. But I understand where the accusation comes from. We are sometimes hesitant to name sin, to identify it clearly. Perhaps that's because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Or perhaps it's because we're embarrassed about our own participation in it. Either way, it's a topic we don't like to face head on. And yet, if we aren't willing to talk about sin, then frankly, our faith doesn't make a lot of sense. The central theme of our story is about how God is putting the world right. We can't tell that story if we don't start from the, the position of the world having something wrong with it. The central image is a cross that represents the cost, the payment for human sin. If we take sin out of the equation, we're telling a story that has no point. The gospel without a clear understanding of human sin, isn't good news. I mean, I'm not sure it's really even news. If it is news, it's, it's strange news. It's like the student who goes off to college on a full-ride scholarship, and when he applies to graduate, the, the bursar tells him, you know, you can't walk, you can't get your diploma until you pay your four years of tuition. Uh, but, you know, no, never mind. I'll, I'll just wipe that out for you. Okay. That's a little confusing. It sounds like I'm still right where I thought I was to begin with. You know, for those who don't realize the weight of their own sin, the gospel is a solution in search of a problem. How can we make sense of God's declaration of forgiveness for a debt we never thought we owed in the first place? Truly, if we don't understand ourselves as sinners in need of salvation, then our faith at root, cannot be about Jesus Christ, about his life and death and resurrection. It might be about his moral teachings, or his courage against corruption, or his values of charity and acceptance. All of that is good, but all that is philosophy, not faith. Faithfulness to God's plan for salvation was the only true reason Jesus went to the cross. If we didn't need redemption from our sin, then the cross is not necessary. Worse, if Jesus' death wasn't somehow about atonement for sin, then it wasn't his will or his father's will that he die in that way. It was just an unjust murder perpetrated by an unholy matrimony of religion and politics. That's not worth celebrating. So if we want to tell the Christian story, the true story and the whole story, it won't do to try to hide our sin. However much we might want to. You know, that is a very natural desire. Looking back at Genesis, we see Adam and Eve did the very same thing. What they learned first about sin was that they wanted to hide from it. They wanted to pretend it, it didn't happen. After they ate the forbidden fruit, suddenly they separated themselves from God. They didn't want to be near God. They didn't want to be found out by God. They heard the sound of the Lord walking through the garden, and they attempted to disappear. They recognized they were naked, they were vulnerable, and they didn't want the truth about them to be seen and to be known. Aren't we just like Adam and Eve? When we realize we've done something wrong, 
we are not eager for it to be known. We'll do our best to keep it from our friends and our family. We'll keep it from our employer, from the authorities, from the public in general. If we have them, we will use our money and our power to keep the truth from coming out. And if we don't have them, or if it's too hard to hide the sin itself, we might just withdraw ourselves from connections with other people. We might quit. We might move. We might stop spending time with our loved ones so that we don't have to face the shame of what we've done. The great irony with sin is that the more we try to conceal it, the more power it has over us. When we hide it, it doesn't go away. It grows. This is the pattern. We sin. We assume anyone who is innocent will judge us for it. We assume forgiveness and understanding are impossible, so we hide. We break healthy bonds, and we exchange them for unhealthy ones. We confide only in those who share our sin, only with those who make us feel like our sin is acceptable. We run from accountability, and without that, we keep adding to our sin. We get locked into a cycle of dishonesty. The more we sin, the worse we feel, the deeper we dig. Sometimes having our sin discovered is the only way out. And sometimes that's quite simply a relief. Fans of the musical Hamilton will know that one of the defining moments of Alexander Hamilton's life was an affair with a woman named Maria Reynolds. After the fact, she and her husband blackmailed him. They wanted to take payments to keep quiet. And so he paid them. He he was trying to keep it quiet, but rumors persisted, and eventually they grew into accusations that he had illegally used government money to, to make hush money payments. Politics in 1797 sounds a lot like politics today, doesn't it? So to use a modern phrase, Hamilton tried to get out in front of the story. He wrote a confession called the Reynolds Papers, detailing the entire affair, telling the truth about everything. And he published it himself. His contemporaries said he was crazy. Historians say that admitting this scandal cost Hamilton any chance he might have had of running for president. But in the long term, his admission may have been the only thing that saved his family, his relationship with his wife, Elizabeth Schuyler. When our sin is confessed and confronted, healing becomes possible. When we're honest and humble, forgiveness is an option. But instead of confessing and confronting, we usually follow the same pattern that Adam and Eve did. First, they tried to hide. When hiding didn't work, they tried to make excuses. Adam... Adam, did you eat from the tree that I told you not to eat from? Well, yeah, God, but you know, it was the woman who gave me the fruit. The woman that you put here, by the way, you're the one that gave her to me. This isn't on me. Eve, Eve, what did you do? Well, God, I ate the fruit, but the serpent tricked me. It's not my fault. The serpent, you made the serpent. His fault. Your fault snake. Do you see what's happening here? Everyone wants to pass the buck. Yeah, I did it, but here's why. Yeah, I did it, but someone else is to blame. Yeah, I did it, but what else could I really have done? This is the natural human response to sin. I didn't have a choice. We don't want to accept responsibility for our actions. We don't want to admit that we could have done better. Honey, geez, give me a break. No, I didn't get those chores done, but the game was on, and and you know I just had to watch it. Mom, Dad, it's not my fault I wrecked the car. I mean, my, my friends just wouldn't stop texting me, and it was too distracting. The lie that we're telling God and others, the lie that sin has us believing ourselves, is that we are essentially blameless. There's nothing wrong with us. We're basically good people, and any mistakes that we make should be classified as exceptions to the rule. We should be treated always as victims, never as perpetrators. 
It's all about what has happened to us, never about what we have chosen, what we have done to others. And to be fair, sin is something that happened to us. It's an inauspicious hand we've been dealt, but it's also something we've chosen to participate in. Sin is, is like being thousands in the hole at the poker table or the roulette wheel and thinking, well, I better just keep letting it ride. Eventually my luck will turn. One more hand, I'll get back in the black. One more spin and, and, and I'll be in the profit. And then Jesus comes along and bails us out, wipes out our debt. And instead of taking this chance to run and leave Vegas for good, we say, oh, look at this, I got a clean slate. I better get back in there and try again. I think it'll go better this time. Sin is a game we choose to keep on playing. Even when we are given the option, the freedom to stop, we cannot attempt to pass the buck on sin. No, if we're truly to overcome it, we have to accept our own responsibility for it. That means we have to talk about it, no matter how much we may not want to. We need to talk about sin. We need to argue about sin. We need to make prayerful decisions together about what kinds of behavior we will honor, what kinds of behavior we will condemn. Because it's easy to fall into the habit of thinking of sin as just a great big do not do list. But sin is really the human test tendency to try to justify anything that we want to do. To try to put ourselves in the position of God and make decisions for God about what's right, about what's wrong. Part of the whole problem with sin is that sin clouds our capacity to discern good from evil. It convinces us our own actions are good, or at least permissible, even when we would easily condemn them as evil in someone else. Community can help protect us from that. The body of faith can help protect us from that. Now, there's no infallible way to avoid the danger. We're all inescapably trapped in the swamp of sin. We can't just leap up, clean ourselves off, and, and stand over on the side and say, okay, now I see clearly. I can tell you all exactly what's right, exactly what's wrong. You give an undistorted report about the truth. But what we can do is talk to each other honestly, patiently, listen to each other, and then come together before God to pray for forgiveness with a truer sense of recognition of our own sinfulness. I trust that when we listen to each other honestly and patiently, when we confess our sin, we will learn from one another that sin doesn't need to keep us ashamed and apart. Sin is the enemy. It is all of our collective enemy. We are not each other's enemy. And we can hold each other up, support each other, and help each other walk away from that enemy. We will find forgiveness together and we will be bound together inseparably in patient, humble, and trusting love when we confront our own and our corporate sin. In the name of God, amen.